How good is that? It's a clap moment, I think. City on a Hill, Brisbane. My name's Ian. I serve as the executive pastor across the City on a Hill movement. And it's my privilege to be with you today as we mark this special moment together. Um, I'm here on behalf of all the other City on a Hill churches to commission uh, Zach together. I want you to know the rest of City on a Hill uh, is with us all in this moment. That video was just played across the other eight churches and each of the lead pastors are right now leading prayers for Zach and for you guys uh, to join in this, mark, uh, in this moment and mark this season together. Uh, Zach and Hannah, you guys come on up. Yeah, welcome, welcome them up. I'm going to lead us through a series of scriptures and corresponding promises and commitments. Most of them are for Zach. Uh, and Zach will respond with a, a hearty... Yes, I do. One is for Hannah. Hannah gets an I will. And we all at the end have a yes, we will. Sounds a bit like a wedding. No one's getting married. Especially with Sonny crying. That's the, that's the sound of weddings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> First Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3.1 says, If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Zach. It's a great thing that God has led you to aspire to this role. Paul also says that pastors must meet certain qualifications and make certain sacrifices and commitments in order to serve as a shepherd of God's flock. With that in mind, Zach, I'll remind you and the church of some important aspects of pastoral character and conduct, and we'll ask you before God and these witnesses to commit to these things. Titus 1, 7-8 says that, an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Do you commit to conduct yourself in that way? I do. Titus 1.9 challenges pastors to hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Do you commit to teach God's word in that way? Yes, I do. 1 Peter 5.2-3 says that elders are to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Do you commit to shepherd God's flock in that way? Yes, I do. In 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul instructs Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do you commit to watch with equal care and zeal both your own life of holiness and faithfulness to God's word and the growth in holiness and conformity to God's word of his church? Yes, I do. 1 Timothy 3.4 says an elder must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Do you commit to love and lead your wife sacrificially as Christ has loved us and as an example to the rest of the body? Despite Sonny's crying, yes, I do. <laughs> do you commit to raise your children to know Christ, instructing and discipling them in the things of the Lord? Yes, I do. Hannah, will you support and encourage your husband, Zach, as he undertakes his role as pastor? Yes, I will. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in preaching and teaching. As you rightly receive honour for your labour in this role, do you commit to remain humble, servant-hearted and teachable? Yes, I do. And here's our one, City on a Hill, Brisbane. As members of this church, we also make a commitment to follow our pastors placed in this position by the Lord. Hebrews 13, 17, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. 
Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Do you commit to respectfully follow Zach as a pastor in this way, to uphold him in prayer and seeking to bring him joy in his responsibilities and ministry? Yes, we do. Church, we're going to pray now. If any of the staff, uh, elders and uh, new council members would like to come down, uh, we're going to lay hands on Zach. And then Mel is going to pray along with Sarah and Grant. Sorry, can someone just run and grab Lisa quickly? From preschool? I think she's in preschool. Come on in, guys. We'll go a bit on each side. Okay, let's pray. Blessed be you, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Lord God, we thank you so much that before you even created the world, you chose us to be holy and blameless in your sight. And you chose Zach to be holy and blameless in your sight. Thank you for choosing him, for loving him, for adopting him into your family. Thank you for redeeming him and forgiving him and lavishing your grace upon him. Thank you for giving him your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we know that it's because of your faithfulness and your promises and your grace that we know that you are with Zach now. We know that you are with our church. We know that you will equip him for the work ahead. And we know that you will give him every gift that he needs to lead us. Lord, we know that you will use him powerfully according to your purposes and for your praise and your glory. And so, Lord God, we ask all these things with your confidence, knowing that you have already gone before us, knowing that Zach is the answer of a year's worth of prayers. And we pray that you would continue to sustain him and equip him. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can stand here today and come before your throne of grace because of the shed blood of Christ, because you have reconciled us to yourself. Lord, I thank you for this moment as we commission Zach into the lead pastor role. And I pray for us as a church family that as we have just um, vowed to do, that we would continue to uphold him in prayer, that we would also recommit in our hearts to uh, this church family here at City on a Hill, Brisbane, that we would be faithful not only in attending on a Sunday, but as we've already heard, that throughout the week, Uh, We are committed as well to knowing you and making you known, Lord. So I pray that we would have uh, a spirit of unity in this time and going forward, Lord, that we would seek reconciliation if it's needed between each other, that we would be united in this mission, that we would be united behind Zach to know you and make you known throughout Brisbane. In Jesus' name. Father, we praise you for this moment right now. We come before you with joyful and thankful hearts for the way you've worked over this recruitment process. And Lord, we thank you uh, for Zach. We, we praise you for him. We praise you that you have opened the eyes of his heart to see the light of the glory of the gospel. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you have given him a great desire to pastor a church, to, to shepherd the flock, to care for your people. And so, Lord, now we uphold him and commit him to you. We ask, Lord, that you'd be at work 
in his life. It's a high calling, it's a weighty calling to be a lead pastor. And yet, Lord, we know that we can rely on you. And, and I ask, Lord, that by your spirit, you'd help Zach to rely on you to strengthen him, to uphold him, to give him everything he needs to, to do the task you have given him as, as lead pastor of Brisbane. Lord, I pray by the power of your spirit, you would help him to trust in the power of your word, that he would trust in the supremacy of Christ, mm. that he would trust in the, the power of the spirit and the power of the gospel to save as uh, in, the, in the high moments and in the tough times. I pray that he would find his refuge in you, that he would mm. turn to you for his strength, for his everything, Lord. So, Lord, we pray for him. And, and Lord, I ask you to help us as a church to be faithful, as we just committed to, to be praying for him, to asking um, you to be at work within him, Lord. Father, we also pray for Hannah, and we thank you for her. We thank you for the way you have opened her eyes to see the light of the gospel. We are so thankful for her great love um, for your son, the Lord Jesus, and how we see that expressed in the way she loves our church. We Lord, we pray you would protect Hannah and Zach's marriage as they enter into this new role, uh, that they would continue to be a a light post for you, Lord, mm -hmm. that you would bring um, your glory to the world through their, through their marriage and their relationship, and that would be strengthened, Lord, in this new role. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for their, their kids, Sonny and Zoe. Lord, we thank you for um, yeah, the great joy they bring to our church, and Lord, we pray uh, your uh, protection over them, Lord. We pray this, that their experience as the, the kids of a lead past would be a positive one, that they would um, grow up reminiscing over this period as a positive um, chapter of their lives, that they would grow deeper in their love for Jesus, deeper in their love for the church. And Lord, we, um, well, I pray again for us as a church to help, uh, to help Zach in his new role. Help us to be faithful in encouraging, in praying, in being gracious uh, and championing him in this new role, Lord. But Lord, we know above all that our, our true lead pastor is the Lord Jesus. And we're so thankful for him. We're so thankful that he lived the life we couldn't without sin, that he died in our place for our sin and he rose again victorious over sin. And Lord, this is only possible here today, only gathered here today because Christ died for us and rose again. Yeah. And so Lord, I pray um, that, that that message, that, that good news, not just true news that Guy mentioned in the video, would be the characteristic of Zach's ministry over the coming years as lead pastor of Brisbane City on a Hill. We ask all these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's welcome your new lead pastor. Amazing. Um, please grab a seat. Um, yeah, significant day. Uh, start of a new chapter of uh, the life of our church. Um, thank you for your prayers. Please continue to pray and encourage um, Zach and Hannah. Um, new chapter, but at the same time, same story. Uh, our story, as Zach said in the video, it's going to continue of knowing Jesus and making Jesus known. Uh, hey, we'll, uh, in a moment, um, Zach's going to get up uh, and preach. I've got a special kind of one-off one -off sermon uh, to, to kind of inaugurate, if you like, his, his commissioning. Um, and uh, he's going to get up and, uh, and read for us from John 17 uh, in a moment. But before that, why don't we just say hello, welcome those around us, and uh, we'll kick things back off in a couple minutes.
Good morning, church. Hopefully you can continue those great conversations afterwards. Hopefully you're able to stick around for a little bit, join some people for a coffee, maybe organise a lunch with some people. A uh, big thank you to everyone today. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you to Ian for flying up and um, yeah, running that moment for us. Um, thank you to our staff. Thank you to our elders. Thank you to our uh, almost confirmed uh, church council. Um, and yeah, if you can make the AGM, um, obviously, if you're excited about numbers, come to that. Um, but even if you hate numbers, come to it just to be in person for that moment with our council members. Um, I think that's really significant for our church. Um, I'm excited about what God has planned. I'm thankful to be given this role of lead pastor. I'm excited that I get to do it alongside all of you um, and the, the many who are at our night service and who weren't able to join us today. Uh, and I'm excited that our vision and mission as a church has not changed. City on a Hill endeavours to reach, by God's grace, 10 cities with uh, the beauty, truth and relevance of Jesus by planting 50 churches. Now, that number might seem intimidating or overwhelming or maybe just strange, but really, it's not the numbers which are important, it's the heart behind those numbers. Ultimately, what this vision expresses is the commitment to seeing local gospel congregations formed, strengthened and resourced for the purpose of seeing more people come to know Jesus. It's been statistically proven that uh, over a, a long period of time, the best way, the most effective method of reaching more people uh, with the good news of Jesus Christ is through church planting. And so, as a movement, we are committed to this, and as a local church here in Brisbane, we are committed to this. As a, a plant ourselves, planted six years ago, uh, we understand, we see the gospel need for more churches to be planted in Brisbane, across Queensland and across Australia. Jesus tells his listeners in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, he says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's important to understand that Jesus is not saying that we are to shine the light of ourselves, as if you and I have something worthy of being shone. We shine the light of Christ. And as this light grows in us, it becomes a greater and more attractive beacon of hope to a world lost in a dark sea of sin and hopelessness. Our mission as a church to know Jesus and make Jesus known epitomizes this reality. The more that we grow in our knowledge of Jesus, the more we will make him known. It's a, a natural reaction to an ever-developing understanding of who Jesus is. And so today we're going to look to this prayer of Jesus in John 17 to understand a bit more of who Jesus is to be captivated by who Jesus is and what he's done for us, what he continues to do for us now and what he promises will be accomplished by his will, in his timing, for his glory. And this prayer is often referred to as Christ's high priestly prayer, which might be strange language for you, but effectively it means that Jesus' prayer here, as recorded by the Apostle John, is a, a prayer for the people of God. It sits between what was considered Jesus' last teaching discourse to his disciples, which can be read in chapters 13 through 16, and is right before he was arrested in the garden and taken away, eventually being crucified on a cross. And this is, begins to be explained in chapter 18, so chapter 17, sitting between those two. It's the climax of Jesus' final words to his disciples, where he's giving them this last lowdown on how things will go and why they can be assured that God is with them. The, mo uh, the most natural approach to this prayer is to break it up where Jesus changes the subject of his prayer. So therefore, we can see that in verse 1 to 5, Jesus prays for himself. 
In 6 through 19, Jesus prays for his 11 apostles. And in 20 to 26, Jesus prays for all those who will believe. And this morning, if there's only one thing you can remember, only one thing you can manage to take home, I hope it's this, that the main point of John John 17 is that Jesus is praying for God's glory through the gospel, passed down to his church, that all God's people might be one as the Father and the Son are one. That main point again, that Jesus is praying for God's glory through the gospel, passed down to his church, so that all God's people might be one as the Father and the Son are one. And one of the major themes running throughout this entire section of John is concerned with how his followers will continue to follow Jesus and accomplish the mission he gives them, even though Christ has now ascended to heaven. And so here we can read these most beautiful words, this prayer from our great high priest. On the eve of his arrest, Jesus stops. He comes before his Father in heaven. And in the hearing of his apostles, he prays a prayer, not just for those apostles, but church, he prays a prayer for you and I today. If you've got your Bibles, open them up with me to John chapter 17. If you don't currently own a Bible, we would love to put one in your hands. Uh, You can go and see our welcome team out the front afterwards. We'd love to put that in your hands and even commit to helping you read it and understand it. Um, So please make sure you talk to us about that. John chapter 17, and I'm going to read the entire thing. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, And you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am going, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
My outline today is following that natural breakdown, but we'll spend most of our time in points two and three. And the three points that I've got here are God is glorified through the gospel. Two, the gospel is passed on to God's church. And three, therefore, God's people will be united as the Father and the Son are united. Point number one, God is glorified through the gospel. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, and as was obvious in Luke's sermon on the Lord's Prayer last Sunday, God is most concerned with his own glory, and this is a very good thing. This entire discourse section between chapters 13 and 17 are topped and tailed by this theme of God's glory. Chapter 13, verse 31 and 32 says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Then in chapter 17, verse 1, as we just read, Jesus prays, Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Again, in verse 5, he prays, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And lastly, in 17, verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. Jesus begins this prayer with a call for God to glorify himself through glorifying Jesus, God's beloved son, whom he has given all authority over all flesh to give eternal life to those that the father has given to him. Verse 2 states that the father gave all authority to Jesus for the purpose of granting eternal life to those that the father had given to the son. And in verse 3, Jesus defines what eternal life is. He says, eternal life is that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is pretty confronting language. If you're anything like me, you wrestle with the idea that eternal life isn't just fun and games in heaven. It's some selfish, for some selfish, sinful reason, when I think of eternity with God, my mind goes straight to my own comforts, my own indulgences, and not to the truth that eternal life is marked by knowing God and knowing his son, Jesus. I think this is because I and possibly many of you have a very low view, a very poor understanding of what it means to know God. What it means to know that God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he sent. But as we will see, it is by knowing God through the gospel, which means good news, that we can have eternal life. It is much more than just an intellectual assent or recognition of a God or of a higher power that is required for salvation. And as Jesus' prayer makes clear, this knowledge um, which leads to eternal life is only given by the Son to those that the Father has chosen and given to Jesus for salvation, for the purpose of God's own glory. The Bishop J.C. Ryle says, the mere knowledge of God is not sufficient and saves none. We must know the Son as well as the Father. God known without Christ is a being whom we can only fear and dare not approach. It is God in Christ reconciling the world to himself who alone can give the soul life and peace. And church, Jesus has done this, as becomes clear in the next section, and he is continuing to do this, as becomes clear in our last section. It's helpful for you and I to realize that even Jesus' purpose on earth was to glorify God. And we can be sure that our task is no different than Christ's, that our entire lives might be to the praise of God's glory. Point number two, the gospel is passed on to God's church. In verses 6 through to 19, Jesus turns the attention of his prayer to his 11 apostles. Now, you're used to hearing the 12 apostles, but at this point there are only 11 because Judas had betrayed Jesus and was lost, that scripture might be fulfilled as verse 12 tells us. Jesus is 
returning to God's own presence where he had glory, so he had the glory that he had with God before the world existed. But the apostles will be left. Verse 11, Jesus says, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Jesus is concerned for the mission of the apostles, which is the same mission for you and I today. It's to know Jesus through the word of God, the good news, this gospel, and to make Jesus known, to go into all the world with the message of God's salvation through Jesus Christ, whom the Father sent. And the landscape is about to dramatically shift for these apostles. I'm sure you've had experiences in life like I have, uh, where it seems like the world before your eyes has become completely foreign. Maybe it's being in a different country with a different culture and language and people. Maybe it's moving to a new city. I know for our family, uh, when we moved from Dubbo or Dub Vegas, as it's lovingly known, uh, when we moved from there to Brisbane, we felt like fish out of water. We, uh, we were confronted by this entirely new landscape. And this is probably a poor comparison to what the disciples were about to go through. They had already had their ups and downs uh, over the three years of Jesus' public ministry. But not long after this moment that we're reading right now, all of the apostles abandon Jesus and the apostle Peter even publicly denies Jesus three times. However, in their weakness, our Lord Jesus remains strong. And here he is praying for these apostles. Verse 9 clearly tells us that. It says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Again, Bishop Ryle says, we learn for one thing that the Lord Jesus does things for God's people, which he does not do for the wicked and unbelieving. He helps their souls by special intercession. Intercession means prayer of intervention or on behalf of another. And so Jesus, knowing what is about to happen, knowing that these apostles are to continue on the mission of the gospel, Jesus prays for his own. And on top of this, Jesus knows that his hour is at hand. He's about to face a cruel and painful crucifixion as the only truly innocent one in place of all of us who are entirely guilty, and yet Jesus still prays for them. There are many things that Jesus covers in this prayer, some of which can be difficult to understand fully, but a few things are plain to see and are helpful. Uh, there is great comfort and encouragement knowing that Jesus prays for the apostles and he prays especially these two main petitions which we can take heart from today. The first one is protection, the second one sanctification. Firstly, there is this beautiful divine protection and ownership between the Father and the Son. The Father has given these men to Jesus, and now Jesus is presenting them back to the Father. Check out these verses. Jesus, praying to the Father, says in verse 6, Yours they were, and you gave them to me. Verse 9, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 10, all mine are yours and yours are mine. Verse 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. And verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. I know that in our age of expressive individualism, the idea that I belong to anyone, to my parents, to a spouse, to a stereotype or cultural norm is becoming more and more offensive by the day. But there is a beautiful truth and comfort that comes from knowing, really knowing and really trusting that we belong to God, that he made us, that he protects us and that he knows us completely. Jesus prayed this prayer for his apostles and in verse 24, we are included as well. We belong to God and to Jesus Christ, his son, 
Jesus says this clearly earlier in John's Gospel. Come with me to John chapter 6. In reading verses 37 through to 40, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. If you're with us today and you don't yet trust in Jesus, I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming to church. Maybe this has been a a big, scary step for you. Thank you for coming this morning. I want to encourage you today to consider these words from Jesus. That the will of the Father, the will of God, the creator of all things, has made a way for you and I to be right with himself. Because the truth is, all of us, everyone in this room, has wronged God. All of us have sinned against God, and the Bible tells us that we deserve death because of our wrongs. But God, in his loving kindness, sent Jesus, his one and only son, and this verse tells us clearly what we need to do. We need to look to the Son and believe that He is able to give us eternal life and eternal life by really intimately knowing God. And just for clarity, that's look to S-O-N, Son, not S-U-N, Son. It will burn your eyes. (laughs) The next chapter of John's Gospel begins the story of Jesus' arrest, his trial, and then his crucifixion. That's in chapter 18. His, the story of his crucifixion, death, resurrection, and his ascending to heaven. And this is the gospel that has been passed on through the generations by this written word that we have in front of us. Be encouraged today to look to Jesus. If you're a Christian here this morning, Brother, sister, we are held by Christ. Our salvation is not an action of us holding on in our own strength, but being held by Jesus. I'm a little better with it these days, but I've always struggled with heights. I think I'm still a little traumatized from a few years ago when my best mate managed to talk me into going on a ride at the Dubbo show that I had sworn I'd never gone on called the Turbo Force. The Turbo Force. (laughs) It's ridiculous. It was this giant ride that had two stupidly long arms with two seats each and you are strapped into these seats and these things just spin around crazy fast and high. I remember gripping onto the chest restraint so tightly that all my arm muscles cramped up for the rest of the night. And the ridiculous part is that I know and I knew while it was happening that if that restraint came loose, I had no chance of holding myself in that seat and I would have been thrown to a grueling end. Sometimes we treat our trust in Jesus like this. We can get ourselves worked up into a place where we think that we are holding on to Christ and the chaos and trials of life that are like those big arms hurling us around at blinding speeds and we are white-knuckled and cramped up under the strain of thinking that we have a chance for holding on for our own lives. And when we come face to face with this prayer of Jesus, when we recognize the beautiful truth church, that we are Christ's, that we belong to him, that he is the one holding us in himself, that the Father has gifted all of his own to Jesus and Jesus has gifted all his own to the Father, that we are held in this divine embrace, then in that place do we find our reason for hope. There's great evidence of this in John's Gospel. Jesus mentions that one of these apostles was lost, that is Judas, the man who betrayed Jesus, the son of destruction. But the apostle Peter, as I mentioned earlier, also betrayed Jesus when he publicly denied him three times. However, Peter repents and is restored in right relationship with Jesus, where Judas is not. 
those that Jesus prays for will have eternal life. They will trust in Jesus throughout their lives, throughout their mission, not because of something worthy of salvation in themselves or in these apostles, but because Jesus is graciously keeping them and he graciously kept them and he's graciously keeping you and I in the gospel. And Jesus also prays that these apostles would be sanctified, which is a a classic Bible word that means to separate, to consecrate, to cleanse and purify, to separate from things that are unholy or unclean. Jesus prays in verses 15 through to 19. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. The word of God, this gospel message of who Jesus is, that he was sent of God by the Father for the salvation of those that the Father has given him is the very means of what will make the people of God sanctified. While these apostles will remain in the world that is unclean and unholy, they are to be different. They are to be sanctified and set apart for the purpose of glorifying God. And Jesus asks that they would be protected from the evil one. We saw Jesus teach this petition in his lesson on prayer in last week's passage in Matthew chapter 6. The people of God cannot be people of the world. We are people in the world, but we must not be people of the world. Jesus prays that his apostles and all his people would be different, and he says that he now sends these apostles into the world. These men that God entrusted the good news to, that they might proclaim it to many more, that they might write it down for generations upon generations to read it, hear it, believe it, be saved by it and sanctified by it. Jesus finishes this portion of his prayer stating that for their sake I consecrate, which again is another word for sanctify. It's the same Greek word, that for their sake I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. This last sentence actually gives us the greatest clue to how all this works. That word there at the end there, sanctified, is a a passive verb. It's a verb that is acting upon a passive subject. In other words, we do not sanctify ourselves. We cannot work hard enough We cannot be good enough. We cannot give enough money or read the Bible often enough. We cannot cook enough meals for the hungry or be environmentally friendly enough to ever sanctify ourselves or make ourselves holy and set apart. It is a gracious work of God upon us as his people, as his treasured possessions. And he does it for the purpose of glorifying himself through our witness. Point three, therefore, God's people will be united as the Father and the Son are united. Jesus once again changes the subject of his prayer. And church, he's praying for you and I. For us, sitting here 2,000 years later, what a picture of Christ's perfection and divinity that he can pray this prayer 2,000 years ago, knowing full well that it will be powerful and active to save, sanctify, and encourage us here today in 2023. Let's read this last portion again, verse 23 to 26. Jesus prays, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Father, 
I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am going, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The commentator Bruce Milne helpfully explains Christ's petition for the unity of his people by likening it to two hands on a clock. There are two aspects of the church's witness which must work together for successful evangelism, to be a a genuine witness of the love and glory of the Father and the Son. The first hand is our word. Just as we who are Christians here today are the result of hearing and believing the word that Jesus gave his apostles. So our carrying on and proclaiming this same word is the means of many more coming to trust in Jesus. Again, Christ's report in verse 8 is just as true of us as it was of those apostles. He says, For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and and have come to know in truth that I came from you, And they have believed that you sent me. They gave these words, Jesus gave these words directly to his apostles. And these apostles have passed on that word to you and I today through the scriptures. We come to know that we come to know in truth that Jesus is the son of God. And that this has been said, he has been sent as our salvation. We know this by receiving the word that Jesus has passed on to his apostles that they passed on to us. And this is why our mission as a church begins with no Jesus. We can't tell about something or someone that we don't know. And we come to know Jesus by receiving his word, believing his word, being sanctified, being made clean by his word and speaking his word to others. And the second hand of the church's witness is our unity. Jesus prays especially for this in verses 21 to 23, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Once again, the bishop brings clarity saying, this is a leading petition of our Lord's prayer to his Father. We can ask for no stronger proof of the value of unity among Christians and the sinfulness of division than the great prominence which our Master assigns to the subject in this passage. So what are we unified in? What is it that Jesus is asking the Father for in this prayer? Well, it's no less than a unity between Christians that represents and witnesses to the love and unity that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now, this sounds lovely on the surface. The idea that Christians right across our congregations, across our city, our nation, even the entire globe, but... Wow, how difficult is it for us to embody this aspect of being the people of God and shining forth the witness of God's great love for all the world. Now, Jesus has already taught this truth in John 13, 34 to 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if You have love for one another. The way that this community of faith behaves towards one another is the second most important and effective means of the world, knowing the love and goodness of God in Christ. Our very call to know Jesus and make Jesus known is embodied in this reality. 
The more we come to know the gospel, the truth that the Father sent his Son to reconcile sinful humanity to himself and to each other, the more our love for one another will grow, and this will result in God being glorified, Christ being made known, and many more people coming to put their trust in Jesus. Again, the commentator Bruce Milne is helpful giving clarity to this unity and quite an extended quote, but he says, the biggest barriers to effective evangelism according to the prayer of Jesus are not so much outdated methods or inadequate presentations of the gospel as are the realities like gossip, insensitivity, negative criticism, jealousy, backbiting, an unforgiving spirit, a root of bitterness, failure to appreciate others, self-preoccupation, greed, selfishness, and every other form of lovelessness. These are the squalid enemies of effective evangelism which render the gospel fruitless and send countless thousands into eternity without a saviour. The glorious gospel of the blessed God which is committed to our trust is being openly contradicted and veiled by the sinful relationships within the community which is commissioned to communicate it. We need to look no further to understand why the church's impact on the community is frequently so minimal in spite of the greatness of our message. We are fighting with only one hand. Church, let's fight with two hands. All of us are guilty of being unloving towards our brothers and sisters in Christ Each of us needs the Spirit of God to cleanse us and to help us love one another. But church, let's pursue unity together, peace between each other, love for one another that the world might know of God's love and glory. Church, Jesus has prayed for us and this is the beauty of it. I know hearing that quote sounds quite heavy and how the heck are we supposed to embody that? But here's how we embody that church. Jesus has prayed for us as he has prayed for his disciples and Jesus' prayers are true. His prayers are powerful and effective to accomplish all that he petitions the Father for. This prayer of Jesus is our great comfort and hope. We can know God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he sent because he has graciously given his word. He gives us the faith to receive it and to believe it and he is actively sanctifying each of us that we might continue to shine brightly the love and light of Christ's gospel as a city on a hill. Jesus has prayed, this prayer has been answered, it is being answered, and it will eternally be answered by God the Father. Church, let's continue to know Jesus deeply and make Jesus known boldly. As the band comes, I'm going to pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be glorified. We praise you for sending Jesus to save us from our sin, to grant us eternal life, which is to know you and know Jesus whom you sent. As we go into this week and together into this year as a church family in a brand new chapter, may we long to know you more. May our hearts be full of the richness of knowing Christ, of knowing that glorious truth of his grace to us. Father, we are sorry for how often we are distracted by petty matters, by gossip, by unloving thoughts and attitudes towards one another. Heavenly Father, would you sanctify us, grant us clean hearts and clean lips that our love for one another might shine brightly your glory to a world that is lost and broken. Jesus, we long for the day when we will see you in all your glory and be with you without the brokenness of our sin or shame. Thank you, Jesus, that you have prayed for us, that you continue to pray for us because we know and trust that your prayers are eternally effective. Amen.